welcome to another Spotlight concert from E Barak and Baroque. This week, it's the turn of the Baroque trumpet. My name is Chris Parsons, and I'm the director of E Barak and Baroque. And when I'm not waving my hands in front of the ensemble, I'm playing the Baroque trumpet. I'm coming from Cambridgeshire, and this concert is aimed to introduce you to the Baroque trumpet, how it works, a bit of history, um, and some extracts of some fantastic music written for it. Along the way, we've got some trumpet music from past performances from Ibra and Baroque delving into the archives um, to enjoy, but also we've been busy with technology, creating some trumpet extracts recorded in isolation, but layered together as you'll see later on. I'm also delighted to be joined by Ibra and Baroque's principal trumpeter, Brendan Musk, as we talk all about the Baroque trumpet. And I'll hand over to Brendan now to start us off to tell us a little bit more about this versatile instrument. Hi, everybody. I'm Brendan and I'm on lockdown at the moment in Penge in South East London and today I'm just going to give you a, a little introduction to the Baroque trumpet or the natural trumpet and talk about how the instrument works and a bit about its development and its, its history. So the natural trumpet is essentially a length of metal tubing um, which has air inside it and if I blow my ear into the trumpet past my lips then the air inside the trumpet vibrates and that creates a sound. If I then want different notes, I can blow faster air, so my lips will vibrate faster and therefore the air inside the instrument also vibrates differently and higher. Now there's evidence of trumpets going back a long way. Um, one good example of this is in the 30s they uncovered Tutankhamun's tomb and found two trumpets um, inside this. So the, because the instrument is designed in a fairly basic way and it's a sim simple technology, you don't need any fancy mechanics or any modern equipment in a way, um, we can create trumpets out of anything almost. Um, so it's used a lot for hunting and you, you, you hear it used in battles and you can use anything from you know a, a simple piece of metal tube to something like an animal horn or a shell um, and Chris is going to demonstrate now how you can use some basic equipment that you might find in your own home to make a sort of trumpet. So yes, um, here is my hose pipe, and if you're a brass player um, and you've got a, a mouthpiece, this could be a great project for you um, during lockdown to have a go at making your own hose pipe um, brass instrument. It's essentially the same as Brendan was saying, a um, piece of tubing, piece of metal tubing, um, or in this case it's, it's a bit of hose pipe with a funnel stuck on the end to give us the bell, um, and of course you have to have your mouthpiece. Um, this always goes down an absolute storm when we take um, some education projects into schools and when we're talking about how the Baroque trumpet works. Um, so I'm now going to give you a little demo, um, just to check it plays a few notes first. It's working. Um, so now I'll give you a performance, a tiny little performance, um, of Handel's hornpipe on the hosepipe. As you've heard so far, whether it's a shell you're playing on, or an animal horn, or a piece of garden hosepipe like Chris just demonstrated, the trumpet makes this brilliant, powerful, strident sound, especially down on the lower nose. And because of these properties, um, the trumpet was often used mainly as an outdoor instrument, so used in hunts, used as a signalling thing, and its uses in music for a long time were quite limited because, you know, it could only play a few of these notes and it was very loud so it would overpower a lot of the other instruments. So it was mainly used as an outdoor thing and used in a, a relatively primitive way. Um, one way that it started to get used, which is, which is really interesting, is to signify war scenes in music. Um, because it's a great instrument to lead soldiers into battle, um, it was often also used so that people you know, listening to an opera or another piece of music would get this feeling um, that a battle is about to start. So Chris is going to talk a bit, a bit more about this just now. 
This extract comes from Purcell's King Arthur, um, which is one of the great stage works that Purcell wrote in the 1690s um, towards the end of his life. Um, a lot of Purcell's music wasn't really performed well on into the 18th century, um, but this piece was. It, was. it was a popular and staple part of, of the repertoire well into the 18th century, probably because it was just packed full of really great tunes. Um, this is one of those great tunes. It comes during Act Five. It's quite a long piece. Um, the whole of King Arthur, and um, it's called a warlike consort, and I can sure you imagine it did a great job um, in the theatre of evoking the scene of a battle to come. trumpet works and I'm just going to say a little bit more um, about what we can play on the Baroque trumpet. We're quite limited that we can only play in two keys so we can play in D major and C major um, and the key of each piece particularly in the Baroque period um, would be used to express a feeling or a certain mood so D major um, is very warlike and again C major is kind of a, a joyous key so composers would use the trumpet to great effect um, in their compositions. Uh, take, for example, uh, the amazing oratorios by Handel, pretty much, what, three hours in length, um, but Handel saves the trumpets for the best bits. So, of course, Handel's Messiah, which is, is his most famous work, the trumpet's hardly in it. Of course, it's in the, the big moments like the Hallelujah Chorus and the trumpet shall sound. Um, you might have seen, in, in some of the videos so far, me and Brendan kind of wiggling our fingers around a little bit. Um, this is because we have some vent holes, which you can probably see if I bring that nice and close to the camera. Almost kind of like a, a recorder keyhole there that, that we have to cover with our fingers and we open them uh, and close them to help us get different notes and, and do different things on the trumpet. Um, this is quite a new invention, uh, although certainly not unheard of in Baroque times, but they're, essentially they're added in to, to keep us more in tune. Um, on certain notes. So I'll give you a little example, is if I don't open the, uh, the vents, um, you'll hear that the F goes very, very sharp. So now though, if I open the vent hole with my thumb, it'll bring that F um, a little bit more in, in tune. So quite a difference with the sound there by using or not using the vent holes. As trumpet playing developed, composers started to experiment with using the trumpet in different ways in their music. Um, so as you'll hear in just a second, when we play higher on the instrument, we move away from this strident, brassy, outdoor sound into something that's much sweeter and clearer. Composers in the late Baroque, such as J.S. Bach, exploited this aspect of the trumpet and started to write lines that were much more florid and complex and intricate. Um, and he was lucky enough to have great trumpet players to write for. One example of this is Gottfried Reicher, who is his trumpet player in the Leipzig period. Um, so when he wrote all of his Leipzig cantatas, um, he was thinking of Gottfried Reicher when he wrote those trumpet parts. And if you listen to any of that music, you'll hear that the, the trumpet lines are incredibly complex and very difficult to play. Um, so Gottfried Reicher must have been a brilliant trumpet player. And I think proof of this is that if you go to the museum in Leipzig, you'll see that there's a room with a portrait of J.S. Bach and a portrait of Gottfried Reicher next to it. So no other musicians, just his trumpet player. So he must have been a big celebrity at the time. Um, we'd now like you to listen to a little example of some of Bach's writing. So this is just the opening of the Et Resurrexit, which is from Bach's B minor mass. Um, and you'll hear here that there's three trumpet parts and they're all 
independent and doing different things and they have these sort of overlapping lines um, which is really fantastic and really exciting to hear so we hope you enjoy it lots of music written for the trumpet alongside a solo singer, particularly a soprano voice. And lots of composers from the Baroque period wrote for this combination and used the trumpet as an obligato or solo instrument. The voice and the Baroque trumpet can blend so well together and there are many examples of this. We've got lots of beautiful arias in, in Bach's Christmas Oratorio, for example, um, and of course in Handel's Messiah with the trumpet shall sound, but also really beautiful ones as well. And um, one that you may have heard at the most recent royal wedding, Eternal Source of Light Divine, again by Handel. Um, here at Eberach and Brock, as our regular followers will know, we like to delve into um, lesser known music from this period. And this next little extract is taken from a piece by George Holmes, who was a composer based in Lincoln in the 18th century and features the trumpet as a solo instrument, duetting with a soprano soloist and then in a full chorus, let every trumpet sound. <laughs> But of course, trumpets were still used for great ceremonial occasions at courts and palaces across Europe, from the grand fanfares of Versailles under Louis XIV uh, to grand gestures from the Georgians on the River Thames. And trumpets would be played in big ensembles. Take, for example, the first performance of Handel's fireworks music in 1749, which would have had nine trumpets all playing at the same time. We're going to perform a short extract from one of Bach's cantatas, which features four trumpets at the same time. And again, you'll hear the difference across all the parts, but particularly the top two parts, which play more florid, higher lines, whilst the third and fourth trumpets, um, those, those lines hark back to the more fanfare, military style of the trumpet. I've just got time to tell you a little bit about a couple of the virtuoso trumpeters of the day back in 18th century England. The first of these was Purcell's main trumpeter, John Shaw. And Purcell really started to push the boundaries of the trumpet. Um, and it's for that man, um, for sure, that he wrote much of his trumpet music. However, it seems that John Shaw fell foul a little of some embouchure problems. Um, and as quoted by Roger North, who also tells us a little bit about what the trumpet was like, um, as follows. That small, portable, and martial tube, as glorious and admired. Um, but he goes on to mention the exacting technique required to play it, noting that the stoutest trumpeter with much use disables his lips so that he cannot perform, which was the case of the excellent Mr. Shaw. A piece that would likely have been written with Mr. Shaw in mind would have been Purcell's Trumpet Sonata. And um, although it's got the title of the sonata, it was probably a, the overture 
to an ode that Purcell wrote, and unfortunately the rest of that ode is lost. But thankfully we have the first three movements and it's become a really popular piece as part of the, the trumpet repertoire. And it's always one of my favorite pieces to play um, because it's one of the very first Baroque pieces I actually started to play um, when I was about 18 years old. I played it first on the piccolo trumpet, as you can see here, which is really completely different to um, how Purcell would have, would have, of course, wanted to hear it with the, with the Baroque trumpet, as you've seen. Um, so it's always nice to return to it as, as one of the first pieces um, that I started to, to play in, in the Baroque repertoire. And you'll hear how Purcell writes so brilliantly for the trumpet um, and how the Baroque trumpet can blend so um, beautifully with, the, with Baroque strings as well, um, far more than a, a kind of more piercing sound than, that the piccolo trumpet makes. Um, you'll hear in the final movement, the third movement, the higher register of, of the trumpet, which creates a more florid sound um, with the kind of running quavers. Um, but then Purcell goes back to kind of the military elements of the trumpet and it finishes with this kind of typical fanfare theme in the, at the end of the third movement, at the end of the piece. Um, as was typical at the time, the middle movement was to contrast the outer ones. So there's no trumpet um, in the middle movement, um, which is a nice breather for the trumpeter, uh, but also a, a mood change for the audience as well, as you'll hear. And this performance um, was from November 2019 at the University of Leeds International Concert Series um, with Ibrahim Barak and myself playing.
carrying on the mantle from from John Shaw was a was a trumpeter called Valentin Snow, um, who was Handel's first trumpeter. So again, many of these daring trumpet parts uh, that Handel wrote into the middle of the the 18th century would have been performed by Valentin Snow. And before we come to our final piece, we'd be really grateful if you feel you're able to do so to give a small donation at the end of this concert. In these challenging times, we are extremely grateful for your support. We recommend a donation of five pounds, but any donation is gratefully received if you are able to make one. This donation will go towards supporting the musicians of Ibarak and Baroque you've heard today, um, as well as securing the ensemble's future. In order to continue striving to further develop our work, we require your support to make this happen. And you'll see details on the screen of how you can pay securely through PayPal, and it's posted in the link on uh, the links posted on YouTube in the comments below. So we'll conclude with a fanfare from Handel's first opera performed in England in 1711, Ronaldo. The opera took London by storm and set Handel on the path to becoming a celebrity of Georgian England. You can imagine the grandeur of this performance just from this one short fanfare. And watch very carefully for a debutant trumpeter on fourth trumpets today in our performance. So thanks for watching. We hope you've enjoyed um, learning and hearing about the Baroque trumpet. Um, keep an eye out on our social media for what's coming up next. Just a few dates for you. Um, our next Spotlight concert um, features the Baroque String family. Um, that's on Friday the 29th of May at 1pm, so um, a date and time for your diaries. And then a little bit later on into June, um, Friday the 12th of June again at 1pm, we've got our Italian themed concert. And again, we'll be welcoming back and baritone John Holland Avery, who's got some um, exciting Italian repertoire to sing for us too. And this, lead, this is leading us up to a, a big project we're working on for around the middle of July, we hope, um, which is going to really showcase um, the vast array of, of music that we perform in Ibarak and Baroque, from chamber music to larger scale works as well. So um, that's just a little teaser of what's to come in, in July. We're really excited about this project, um, kind of bringing together lots of, of Ibarak and musicians um, from across the country, wherever they are at the moment. Um, and so we're really looking forward to that as well. So keep an eye out um, for news on exactly what that's going to be. So look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks for watching.